Thank you for your interest here at North Hills, where we are more than Sunday. If you have any questions or would like to know more about our ministries, you can always visit us online at north-hills.org. Now join us as Pastor James delivers his message. Hello, my name is James. But it wasn't always that way. On July 4th, 1982, my mother told my dad it was time to go. And they headed off to the hospital where they expected that they were going to be bringing home a bouncing baby girl. Yes, that's right. I was supposed to be a girl. They were confident I was going to be a girl. The sonogram said I was going to be a girl. They missed something. And when they got to the hospital, my mom tells me the story all the time. I was ready to be born even before I got there. She was at the hospital for 45 minutes before here comes me into the world. But there was one little problem. When I was born, I was obviously not a girl. My parents were so convinced I was going to be a girl that they didn't even bother picking a, a boy's name. My name was supposed to be Lauren Michelle Watson. <laughs> Lauren Michelle Watson. So I am born, and my parents are like, well, I don't think we can name him that. So here I am, born nameless. I have no name. I think it's a fitting start to be born nameless. Because then what happens? What will your name be? Who will you become? So much of our lives are about the name we are given. And I wonder how much our parents put into thought regarding the name that they give us. I have chosen or helped choose the names of two girls. And I think so much of it is does it sound good with your last name? And we give them the name. Now, Amanda and I, we did put some thought into our daughter's middle name. Mia's middle name is Joy. We hope that she would grow up to be joyful. Emily's middle name is Grace. We hope that she'll grow up to have grace in her life and experience the grace of God. But here I am born, and I'm nameless. My mom was like, well, what do we do now? Baby boy Watson, that's not going to fly in elementary school. So my mom looked around. She's like, well, I have three brothers. My oldest brother's name is James, then Michael, and Anthony. And she said, those are pretty good names. So she threw them together, James, Michael, Anthony, Watson. And that is how I got my name. <laughs> I am very close to my uncle's because I have their name. And it's cool to be named after somebody. But the reality is, is that birth, a lot of times we think it gives us our identity. We think that the name that we're given at child, you know, at, at our birth, gives us our identity. But the reality is, is that we have no idea at birth who we will be. We have no idea if the names that we are given we will live up to. I don't know if you've ever looked into a child's eyes, a baby, newborn, and wondered to yourself, who will you be? I think it's fitting that when somebody in the Bible has a huge transformation in their life, God changes their name. He gives them a new name. It's almost like he says, that wasn't ever your name. I will give you your true identity. But our birth, we think about our birth, we think about how we're born, and there's so much that goes into our identity at birth. And the reality is, is that so much of our life is about overcoming some of the assumptions that are made about our identity at birth. I want you to think about this for a second. Life. Your life, from the time you are born until the time you pass on from this life, is about finding your identity. 
and identity is about transformation. Transformation from a false identity into your true identity, who you are. What I love about God is that God talks about the different ways in which he speaks to us. God speaks primarily through his word. He tells us in his word who we are. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But then he also says that there's a place in nature that God speaks to us in nature. And over the next couple weeks, I want to look at the life cycle of a butterfly. You know, you look at a butterfly and you think, how did that butterfly get to be a butterfly? And you look back over the life cycle of a butterfly and there's really four stages. There's the egg. There's the egg of all butterflies that are born and I have this picture. This is how butterflies are born. Their adult butterfly lays eggs and then goes off and, and leaves them. And, and what I, when I was looking at this, I realized that we automatically assume, I don't know how many are, eggs are up there, but we automatically assume that all eggs are destined to be butterflies. But the reality is that only one in a hundred of these eggs will ever live to be a butterfly. I don't know if it's by choice or whether or not it's something eats it, but not all eggs will live to be a butterfly. There's steps that go, and there's, there's hang-ups that will keep you from going from an egg to the second stage, which is a larva. A larva is the fancy word for caterpillar. And caterpillars walk along the life. And what's interesting about a caterpillar, they have one job and one job only, and that is to eat. They eat and eat and eat, and over the course of three weeks, they will gain like a thousand percent of their body weight. And then a caterpillar will go into a cocoon or a chrysalis to have this transformation process. And then maybe that chrysalis will develop into a butterfly. And we look at our own lives and we look at, you know, we don't have these, this kind of this physical transformation process other than we're born a baby and then as we get older, we just really look like a bigger baby. Our legs get longer, our bodies get bigger, our heads get bigger. Like, we kind of, you know, you, you look at a baby and you're like, okay, that grows into a person. Our transformation is internal. Our transformation is spiritual, emotional. Yes, there's a huge physical trans transformation as we get bigger. But really, the truth of our identity is not as much physical as it is spiritual and emotional as we determine who we are or as we have who we are determined for us. So I want to go to this passage in Scripture, and this is our, our theme verse for this entire sermon series about Hello, My Name Is. You know, we look at names, but the reality is that our name doesn't always give us our identity, doesn't always tell us who we are. Our identities are often rooted in other things. And many of those things are false identities. And over the next course of the next couple weeks, we are going to be stripping away some of those false identities in order to get to the potential of our true identity. So today we start simply at our birth. All of us start in the same way. I think that's odd. We all start in the same way. And I'm not talking about what happens on the outside of the world, what you're born into, but we're all born the same way. And many of us, we find our identity at birth and we never allow it to change. But we have to strip that away because as this passage will tell us, in order to get to our true identity, we have to leave those false identities behind. Turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to begin in verse 16. I want to bring these things into the light. Um, as you're going there, um, let's just remember that Paul is this person that was born in a certain way. He was born a Jewish person to Jewish parents. He had a huge transformation in his life that led him to a new identity. 
But in order for him to get there, he had to let go of the way in which he was born. He had to very much turn his back on the way he was born. And he had to turn his back on his family as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What I want to talk about today is at the start. At the beginning, we're born in a certain way, we, we identify a certain way, we have this identity that's given to us at birth. We don't know much about it. You know, at birth, I mean, how many of us remember the day of our birth and how many of us remember the first five years of our lives? We don't. A lot of it is given to us and assumptions are placed on us. And there's a lot of different things that keep us there. But what I want us to know is that your beginning doesn't determine your end. Now, I know that sounds like this kind of this statement that you say, but, you know, it's kind of this, a blanket thing. Of, of course, it doesn't determine your end. But for, for some of us, that is an encouragement. Just because I was born into the world in poverty doesn't mean I have to end the world in poverty. The opposite is true. Just because you're born rich doesn't mean you'll end rich. Just because you're born healthy doesn't mean you're end healthy, un end unhealthy. But just because you're born unhealthy doesn't mean you'll end unhealthy. There's physical things, you know, about that. Then there's also the spiritual aspects of that that we play into today. Just because you're born into a Christian household does not mean you're going to make it to adulthood following Jesus. In fact, most of the people in the world today who cut become followers of Jesus, don't start that way. People around the world are coming to Jesus and it's costing them everything. Your beginning doesn't determine your end. And many of our false identities, many of these things that we put our hopes and our prayers and our dreams in, they start at birth. Just think about the ways in which we get our identity from our birth. We get our name from our birth. Yeah, my name is James, but when I was born, the world sees me in a certain way. They sees me as a white, middle-class American. Wasn't necessarily rich, wasn't necessarily poor. Given opportunities that other people don't necessarily have. Started out that way. I was born healthy. But not too long after I was born, my parents divorced. And I could allow that to be my identity. But just think about all the people in the world. When you're born, you're born a certain way. You're born rich or you're born poor. You're born a certain race that becomes to define you and that becomes, in a, in a sense, your name, that you are black. Your name is white. Your name is Asian. Religion. You know, you think about somebody like Paul. Paul was born into the Jewish religion. And man, many of us, we've heard this said, if you were born in another country, if you were born in Saudi Arabia, you'd be a Muslim. If you were born in Israel, you would be Jewish. It, just because, you're the, and they'll say this, the only reason you're a Christian is because you were born in the United States. But that's not the reality for a lot of the world. And a lot of the false identity that we as followers of Jesus have to get rid of is somewhat created by the American culture. And we have to set aside that. And I don't mean that the American culture is bad. I'm proud to be American just as anybody else. 
but being an American is not my identity. Just because I was born here, that's, that can't be my identity. So much of our identity continues in birth on who our parents are. You know, are our parents together? Were we born to a single parent? Were we raised by a single parent? You know, were we born in America? You know, were our parents Americans? Were our parents ethnic from other cultures? One of the things that I see a lot of, particularly in a city like Vallejo, is that we have first, you know, you know people who have immigrated to the United States raising kids that are being raised in the United States. And there's somewhat of a kind of lost in translation where kids being raised here are losing some of their culture that their parents brought here. And it causes conflict. There's identity crisis. We think about what Paul says here. He says, let no one, we regard no one according to the flesh. You know, and what does that mean? It simply means that we're no longer going to look at people and give them their identity based upon what the world looks at when they're born. You know, even somebody like Jesus, he uses Jesus as an example. Why is Jesus a perfect example of this? Because how was Jesus born? He was born a king, but he was born in a stable. That doesn't make any sense. He was born Jewish, but he came to die for the sins of the whole world. We regarded him according to the flesh, but we do that no longer because our identity is more than just the way in which we were born. Our identity is more than where we were born. Our identity is more, is more than how we were born. The world defines us a certain way by the way we were born. We have to overcome that. The labels that we allow the world to put on us, we can no longer accept. From now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. We look at their spiritual identity. And here's the truth. Our spiritual identity at birth, we are all in the same boat. We are all born with one spiritual problem. We are all born sinful. We are all born into sin. We have this sin nature and, um, you know, this is hard for me. You know, it, it's hard for me to, to look into a baby's eyes and think, this child was born into sin. This child's number one most important need is not food to be changed and to be, you know, a, a nap. But this child's most important need is a savior. And that's a role as a parent. You know, we don't like that. We don't like saying, a oh, baby's sinful. But I have a toddler, and I can tell you, children are sinful. Babies are sinful. They need Jesus, just like any of us do. I don't know, you know, we always talk about, well, you know, what happens if a baby dies? I don't even want to think about that. Does God let him to heaven? That's not up to, but we, we make up these, these things like, well, there's an age of accountability. There is no age of accountability in Scripture. I trust that God is going to make the right decision, but each child needs to be raised to know their identity from the start. Your identity when you're born is that you are a sinner in need of a savior. I didn't just make this up. This comes from scripture. Romans 5, 12. Just as sin came into the world through one man, the death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans 3, 9, none is righteous, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Psalm 51, 5, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. We all have a sin problem. From the day we are born, we have a sin problem. Our identity, our name is sinful. And I know that sounds terrible to say, but I think sometimes we tell people, we tell our young people that you are a child of the one true king before they make that decision to follow Jesus. And we lie to them. At some point in your life, a transformation must take place for you to become a child of the one true king. 
and it does not happen at birth. We have to lead our children into that idea that you must come to grips with who you are at birth. Not about being rich, not about being poor, not about being black or white or American or you know, from another country in the world, German. But at birth, we all have the same problem. We all have that sin problem that we have to deal with. But here's the encouragement. I know that might have, this last second point, man, that was a real downer. But here's the encouragement. This is the beauty of this. Is being born a certain way doesn't mean we have to stay that way. Being born a certain way, being born into sin doesn't mean we have to stay that way. You know, we, we get this, that being born poor does not mean you stay that way. You pick yourself up, you work hard, and you make something of yourself. We love those stories. We love the stories of people, the underdog, who pick themselves up. But how often do we think about ourselves and we think about how we all have this spiritual problem that we have to overcome and the reality is that we can't overcome it. It's not like God is looking at every single baby and like, okay, maybe this one will not be sinful. He knows. And that's why it's so beautiful that he provided a way for transformation in our lives. But we have to come to grips with that ourselves, our, our birth identity, we have to put that away. We have to put the old away, and we have to embrace the new. That's what Paul talks about in 517. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, there is two kinds of people that when you, you hear this statement, just because you're born a certain way doesn't mean you have to stay that way. There's a certain degree of some of us are really encouraged by that. We feel like, okay, yes, just because I was born into this adversity doesn't mean I have to stay that way. That there is a way for me to overcome that. You know, I think about this, we, we talk a lot about parents and the role that parents play in the spiritual formation of their kids. Many of us assume that if we are following Jesus, that our kids will automatically follow Jesus. And we hope that our kids will follow Jesus. But I want to challenge you, have you ever thought about why? Why is it that you want your kids to follow Jesus? Why is it that we want the next generation to follow Jesus? There's a lot of different answers. Do we want our kids to follow Jesus because we want them to be good people? We want them to be morally upright? Do we want them to be happy? Do we want them to have peace in this life? Do we want them to have this sense of church is important? For those of us who are striving to raise our kids to follow Jesus, we fall into the trap of thinking that Jesus is a means to an end. That if I lead them to Jesus, then they are going to be good, upright people who do good things and don't commit crime. There's only one answer to that question. Why do we want our kids to follow Jesus? We want them to follow Jesus because Jesus is the end. We want them to follow Jesus because Jesus is what we want them to have. Jesus is not a means to an end. He is the end. Now, if I turn that question on you, why do you follow Jesus? We might answer that question a whole lot of ways. Why do we follow Jesus? Well, we follow Jesus because my parents followed Jesus. My parents took me to church when I was growing up. I follow Jesus because he gives me peace. I follow Jesus because, you know, I was lost and he's found. I follow Jesus because fill in the blank. If we don't follow Jesus because we want Jesus, then our answer misses the point. Jesus is enough. We want to follow Jesus because we want Jesus to be us. When we look at this passage at the end, it says, when he talks about what's the purpose of following Jesus, for our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, when we think about Jesus, Jesus was that baby born, 
Interestingly enough, Jesus was born just the way everyone else in this room was born. He was born from a woman. Yet when he lived, he did not sin. He lived his entire life perfect. And then when he got to the point where he was getting ready to die, remember the wages of sin is death. Jesus did not sin. Therefore, Jesus did not deserve death. So Jesus made, God made Jesus sin so that in him we can become the righteousness of God. This is the, the transformation, is that we were born sinful. Jesus was not. Jesus dies for our sins so that we can have the identity that is righteousness. But in order for that to happen, we have to let go of the way in which we were born. We have to let go of the identities that we've allowed for us to define us over the years. We have to let go of our families. We have to let go of our family identity. We have to let go of our names. We have to let go of all of these things and we have to find our identity simply in Jesus. But that's hard because the Bible talks about these things. The Bible talks about us finding our identity in Jesus, but so much of us, so many of us, we find our identity in the way we were born. Find our identity in our race. We find our identity in our, our money. We find our identity in you know, being born in a certain country. We find our identity in the religion of our birth. We have to get beyond that. You know, we talk about discipling young people. And you've heard me say that the number one people that disciple young people is parents. And that's true of people in the church. But what about people around the world? There are so many people born today who will find their identity in atheism, who will find their identity in Buddhism, all these other religions of the world. Their parents will not disciple them we have the opportunity as followers of Jesus to disciple other people. So if our model for evangelism and discipleship does not go beyond our own family, we've missed the point. The church has to step in and disciple those who don't have parents who are following Jesus. Next week, I don't know if we've talked about this, but Ann Flood has a group of Chinese students coming over from China to the United States. Many of these students don't know Jesus, and they never will because their parents don't know Jesus. This is an opportunity for our church to speak into the life of people who are coming from another culture, another country, whose identities are rooted not in Jesus, but are rooted in the way in which they were born, the country in which they were born. We have the opportunity to help them leave behind that identity, embrace in a new identity in Christ. But she still needs two host homes that are willing to take two girls each. Would you be willing to take two girls each for five weeks as an opportunity to help these four girls embrace a new identity? That is our challenge as a church, our challenge as a church is to get away from our, our birth identity. Our, ch- our challenge as a church is to help others to reach the world with the, with the gospel. But I think before we can do that, we have to come face to face with our own identity crisis. We have to come face to face with our own things that we define ourselves as. You know, in your bulletin, you had one of these name tags. One of them I hope you put on so that we can know your name, but there's another one in there. And as we enter into our reflection time in a few minutes, I want you to think about those things in your life that give you your identity, the ways in which you were born, where you have found your identity your entire life, that you have said that my name is American, my name is my race, my name is, you know, you fill in the blank. Where did you find your identity in your life? It's not saying that these things are necessarily bad. It's not bad to be an American. It's not bad to be Filipino. It's not bad to be anything that you were born with. But those things cannot define you if you are to make the transformation. Thinking back about the butterfly, 
If we are to make it to a butterfly, we have to leave behind some of those false identities. And yes, as much as it pains me to say, our, if your identity is rooted in anything other than Jesus, then it becomes a false identity. But I want you now to specifically think about how you were born. And as we enter this reflect, how is your birth, the way you were born, where you were born, who you were born to, how has your birth determined your identity? And I want you to take whichever name tag you didn't use. I use the red one. Um, maybe you use the blue one. So whichever one you didn't use. And I want you to write on there something from your birth that gave you your identity. Whether or not it was your parents. Whatever it is. And I want you to write that down. And during our reflection time, I'm going to move this down front. And what I want you to do is I want you to, to you know, during the song... I want you to simply bring it up and I want you to put it on this board. Just stick it to the board showing that you are leaving behind that identity. Whatever it is. You know, for me, I don't know. I was just thinking about this. You know, maybe it's that I was born an American. Maybe it was I was born, you know, a white guy. Whatever it is, take this time as, as you reflect on this message, as you look forward to identifying who you are, what do you have to leave behind? As the band plays, think about this. You know, who, who are you? Who do you want to be? And what do you have to leave behind to get there? As we spend this time reflecting, I think we all want our identity to be in Christ. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, I think we know that we want Jesus. I, know that, I think we know that we want our identity to be all about what Jesus wants. But there are some things in our lives that keep us from getting there. There are other places we find our identity that are keeping us from embracing that full identity that Jesus gives us. And I recognize that there are some people in this room that are still dealing with that sin nature that is our identity from birth. That we still need that savior. You know, if that's you, and you recognize that you are not yet in the body of Christ. You haven't yet chosen to follow Jesus. Maybe for you, it just simply is a matter of saying, hello, my name is sinful. And we own that. We own our separation from God and we acknowledge that God provided a way that we don't have to have that anymore. And we simply just write that on the card bring it up, stick it to the front and embrace our identity in Christ. Now, it's not as simple as just saying, I'm gonna embrace Christ, there's still a process and we get to that the rest of the sermon series. But we have to start somewhere and maybe for you as someone who's not following Jesus, who's never been baptized, who's never made that profession of faith, that's the place we start and tell the church and we will rejoice with you. But for all of us, in order to embrace our identity in Christ, we gotta leave something behind. Father God, we thank you for the opportunities that you give us as a church to talk about you. But Father, we think about the ways in which we found our identity in our life, the way we were born. We think about even the good things our family. And it's odd that you tell us, that Jesus tells us that anyone who doesn't hate his mother, father, brother, sister is not worthy to follow you. We know you don't want us to hate them, but we know that you want us to not find our identity in them and that our love and our devotion for you and our identity in you should be so strong that anything else by comparison would look like hate. 
Father, help us with open eyes to see the false identities in our life, starting at birth, that keep us from following you fully and finding our identity in Jesus. Father, as we reflect on this, I know that this is hard for us to let go of these things. But I pray that we would look at you and see a God that is worth it. So as we reflect, God, speak to our hearts, reveal to us those things that are not of you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So as you just feel led, write down something and just come up, peel it, and stick it to the board. And after a few minutes, we'll close out.